And I want to start in verse 9. And this is really our heart for you, as it was Paul's heart for the Colossians. He said, and we say this morning, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And I can tell you that when Janet and I leave this place today and we continue in our travels and we would ask that you would pray for us as much as we're going to be praying for you. We're going to be traveling several different places over the next week. And uh, of course, the message continually travels all over the world. But when we leave this place today, we're not going to forget about you. And we're not going to forget about the moments that we've shared in glory. And we will not forget about these things that God has done for us. Because what God has worked was not about a weekend or just a week or just a few days or just about a service. But what God has been doing is about eternity. God has been releasing the eternal realms of glory to us because there's something that we're called to and something that has happened over the last few days and over the last week. What has happened in to, inside of us is going to spill out in the days ahead and it's going to begin to carry us into new realms, new places that we've never been before. So we are going to continue to pray for you. And our prayer is this. Our prayer is that God will continue to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That your understanding of him, that your revelation of divine glory will continue to increase and expand. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Do you realize that through Christ Jesus, he has qualified you. There's so many things in life that appear and begin to rise up and they say, you're disqualified. You don't belong. You, you can't have this. You, you, you can't accept that. But I'm telling you this morning that through Jesus, he has qualified you to be partakers of divine inheritance for those that are in the light. Hallelujah. Some say, I'm walking in the light, even as he is in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now, verse 13 of Colossians 1 is a very interesting scripture. In this translation that I'm reading from, it says that he has conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. If you're reading from the King James, it says he has translated us. And it's probably actually a more accurate translation that word translated because it gives a picture of supernaturally being taken from one place to another place and when you're translated in the spirit it's not like you have to go through this long journey and all this kind of stuff to get to where you're going i'm telling you when the spirit comes on you and he translates you in the spirit you go from one place to another place instantly would it be okay if I share a testimony with you this morning? Are you ready for it? Okay, if you say yes, then don't get upset after I tell you the testimony, okay? Quite a few years ago, Janet and I, we had hosted a conference up in our place in London, Ontario, Canada. It was a powerful conference. I mean, God did a lot. There was a lot of miracles. There was great signs and wonders. There, all the manifestations, I mean, just, it was glorious. It was amazing. But you know how every conference is. You know you're going into a meeting, coming out of a meeting, going back into a meeting, coming out of a meeting. You're just kind of, you know, we get back to our hotel room and, you know, the, the clothes just kind of fly onto the, the um, open suitcase, but they don't really get folded and put away all nice and neat. We did that this morning. We had to fold everything, put away nice and neat and, you know, all that. Well, at a conference, you know, just kind of rushing around and something about me that I'll tell you is although I, I like wearing rings in the meetings, Outside of the meetings, I never like wearing any rings or any jewelry or anything like that. So I always take my stuff off. And oftentimes, 
if I'm in a rush, I forget where I put it. And there are many times Janet could tell you about when I lose my stuff. And uh, I had been rushing around in that conference. And at some point in the conference, somewhere between our house and the church and our offices, I had taken off. I had a pinky ring on this hand. I had my wedding band on this hand. And I had a watch that I used to wear. And I'd taken it off. All three of them, I'd, I'd take it off. Well, right after the conference, we were leaving to go down to California. We were, this is when we were just starting our ministry in the U.S., we were actually just starting it up and we were leaving with a suitcase of stuff and that's all we had to our name. We just went down and we started uh, working all the legal things to set up a ministry down in California. So because we were leaving in such a rush, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to find my pinky ring, my wedding band, or my wristwatch. And so I had to leave Canada without it. Now, it's, you know, you th say, well, that's not a big deal. You just go back and find it later. Sure, that's fine. But I didn't know whether it was in our house I didn't know whether it was at the office. I didn't know whether it was at the church, somewhere in the conference room, I, you know. And the thing that bothered me the most was, number one, this pinky ring was an inheritance ring that was given to me by my father-in-law. It had 47 diamonds in it. And uh, it was an inheritance ring that he told me I could wear it until Lincoln's fingers, my son, his fingers were big enough for him to be able to wear that ring. Then it would have to pass on to him and he'd pass on to his son and it would, you know, that's the way it would go. So anyway, I was upset about that, but I was also upset about the wedding band because that week happened to be our wedding anniversary. I don't remember the number, maybe 14, I think 14, something like that, maybe. Or maybe not. Actually, it definitely wasn't because it was all the way back in 2006. Okay, it was our seventh anniversary, seventh wedding anniversary. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so I was upset about this, but we went on we went to California and that was that well we went and we for our anniversary I took Miss Janet over to the Japanese steakhouse in town we like the Japanese steakhouse that's always fun it, you know hibachi it's always a show and dinner and you know anyway nice so we're sitting there and we mentioned to the cook who's cooking that it's our wedding anniversary and he looks at us and he giggles and he thinks we look too young to be married which that's always a nice thing for someone to tell you and uh but then he looked at my finger and he said, you don't have a wedding band. And that made me feel really bad that I wasn't wearing my wedding band on our wedding anniversary. And so I was thinking about that and thinking how much I wish that I had been able to find and not knowing where this stuff was. And maybe somebody actually stole it. Maybe I had left it at the church on the, the stage or in the back room. Or I mean, we just didn't know where it was. And we had called up our secretary. We had looked all over our apartment. For everything and we called up our secretary and asked her to go to the apartment and look around and she looked around the office and she couldn't find anything so we were kind of upset well I was mostly upset Janet was a little bit maybe bothered by it maybe okay she says of course and uh, anyway so it was just something that was irritating me well we were trying to set up this home in California to get the ministry going and after one week of being out there, we had come really down to the end of nothing. Um, we didn't have any much more money left, and we were still having to furnish a home and trying to get office supplies and set everything up. Anyway, it's a long story, and I won't bore you with all the details, but something that is so amazing is when God tells you to go somewhere, he has someone waiting for your arrival. Even if you don't know it, even if you've never connected with them before, God always has a person, a place, an atmosphere set for you in the place that he's calling you to go. It's amazing. And so we knew we were called to be down there. And at the end of the week, we had run out of, I guess, most of the money that we had. And I was going to go preach at a church in Redlands, California, which is not too far from Palm Springs. And when I went to Redlands, I was preaching and I just made mention real quick that we had actually just kind of moved in the general vicinity area and that we were 45 minutes down the road in Palm Springs. And I'm telling you, after that meeting, we had a whole group of intercessors come to us at the book table and they said, we are from Palm Springs and we have been praying for years that God would send glory people to Palm Springs. We know that you are the people that God has sent and we're ready to help. We're ready to work with you. We're ready to, to do whatever you need us to do. And they said, we have a Bible study on Tuesday. Will you come over to our Bible? I think it was on Tuesday. 
I'm pretty sure it was Tuesday. Anyway, it was midweek, and they said, will you come over and speak to us in this little Bible study? We said, sure. We were excited to have friends. I mean, we didn't know anybody in the desert, and God had brought these people to us. So we went over to the home uh, for the Bible study, and, at the, and it was a wonderful study, and we spent time in the presence of God. But at the very end, we started to go all the way around the circle, and everybody started to introduce themselves and tell about their occupations and their little bit of their life history and what they were doing and all this. And see, Janet and I, we had been thinking that a black couch would be real nice in this mid-century home that we had in Palm Springs, but it had to be a certain style because, you know, with the mid-century, there's a certain style that goes with mid-century. You can't, you can't put, like, old antique farmhouse into a mid-century house. It has to be the right style. Now, I know you're saying, well, you know, if you don't have any money, then you just got to take whatever you get. But I don't think that's the way it is with God. Because God's very specific about things. Everything he does is with excellence. He is the creator. He is the master designer. And that creativity and design gets on the inside of you. And you just know that second best will not do. Come on. So Janet and I had a vision for this home and the way it was going to look. And like I said, we didn't have very much money left. And we had gone into some of the different furniture stores in the area. And there were some furniture stores that had a very nice price for the couches and for the furniture. But their couches were like brown or they were red or they were blue or every other color except for black. And we knew that we needed a nice, sleek, black couch in this room. And so uh, we looked around and we couldn't find anything. And then we went into one furniture store and we saw exactly what we needed. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And we, we looked at each other. This is the one right here. This is the one. And then, of course, you know, you go and you turn the, the price tag. $10,000. Well, that's why it was the one because it was, it was very nice. It was very nice. <laughs> And so, of course, we didn't get that one uh, because it just seemed like that was too much to pay, although it looked like it was the right one. So, and we don't have a poverty mentality, but we want to be good stewards of what God gives to us. Come on, we want to operate in integrity with finances and all of that. So, anyway, we didn't get it. But here we were sitting at the Bible study, and we're going around the, the, the room, and we get to this one lady named Donna. And Donna tells us that she owns a designer store, furniture store, in town. And she begins to tell us, you know, how much she loves to bless people with the furniture and how she loves to give it away and how she was able to decorate Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn's home and how she was able to decorate, I know you don't like Bill Gates right now, but she was able to decorate Bill Gates' home in the desert and she was able to decorate the Nordstrom's home in the desert and all these people that are of great affluence and influence she's been given the opportunity to go in and decorate their homes and and she says about every year or two years they want to redo everything and so sometimes she'll take some of the stuff back and then she'll give them brand new stuff and gives them a deal and it all kind of works out anyway she said i i don't know what you're doing right now with furniture since you just moved here but she said i'd love to help you out and we said wow that would be amazing she said well i don't know whether you need a couch or not, you know where this is going. And we said, well, we do actually need a couch, but Janet and I were thinking at the time, we need a black couch. It, it, like, it's really kind if she's going to give us like a brown leather sofa, but that's not what we need. We need a very specific black. Anyway, she said, I'm not sure whether you'd want to take it or not, but I've got a couch and it's black. And she said, it's a designer couch. She said, it's very expensive, but I would just give it to you. And uh, she said, you can come by and look at it. Well, we went by and we looked at it. I'm telling you, that was the couch that we wanted. That was the couch that we needed. And it was even better than we realized because when we saw it, we thought it was just a couch, but it was a sleeper sofa that pulls out and it was... It was made with this foam. There weren't springs in it. It was like this really great foam. 
She told us, she said, the president of the United States could come to your home and sleep on this couch and he would have a wonderful rest. And she was right. So anyway, we got, we got the designer couch that I believe God put in our spirit that we needed because when he begins to design things, he also pays for them. Hallelujah. Listen to me. When God gives you a vision, he backs up that vision with divine provision. He does. And there's some things, some visions that look really, 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 really big. And in the net, it seems like, how would this all possibly come together? God, I know you've shown me this and you've shown me that and you've shown me this little part, but God, how would, just get in the spirit just pray in tongues like you never prayed. Be led by God to the right places and the right connections. And watch what God will do. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, he's able to do it. So we got really, really blessed with this couch. And then she gave us some other designer furniture stuff that we put in the bedrooms and different rooms. And it, I mean, our house was furnished in a designer way, and we did not pay a cent. That's amazing. And that's only God, only God. And God blessed us through that group of intercessors and they worked with us for many years. But the part I wanna tell you is this. A few days later, I'm sitting in this chair and we've got the, the television on the floor of the living room because we didn't yet have a cabinet to put it on. And Lincoln was watching his cartoons and as I was sitting in the chair, I just kind of dozed off to sleep. And as I was sleeping, all of a sudden, I had the most wonderful dream. In the dream, I was back in our offices, our ministry offices in Canada. And I walked from the front of the offices back into where we had kind of a, it was a product storage as well as a mailroom combination. And I walked back there and I looked into the mail slots. And as I looked into the mail slots, I saw in the very back of the mail slot, I had taken off my rings and my watch and I had shoved them, you know, because you do stuff like that when you're just busy, you're just like, you know, and then you just go on and you forget what you're doing. I had taken my stuff and I had shoved it in the back of the mail slot, never to be found, you know. And uh, here I was in the dream and I saw it. I saw it in the mail slot. And I thought, that's so wonderful. And so I reached in the mail slot and I took it and I put on my pinky ring. I reached in the mail slot and I put, or my wedding band, I put on my pinky ring and reached in the mail slot and I put on my watch. And I thought this was real nice. And all of a sudden, Lincoln's cartoon started. He was watching SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> and that cartoon flared up. And you know how obnoxious sound is right. It flared up. It woke me up out of that. Dream. And I said to Lincoln, I said, Lincoln, turn the TV down. Because I was having this wonderful dream. When I said, Lincoln, turn that TV down, I looked and that pinky ring was on my pinky. The wedding band was on my wedding finger and the watch was on my wrist. No, you didn't hear what I said. You did not hear what I said. I lost my stuff in Canada. Two weeks later, I'm sitting in California and through a dream, a realm opens and I go inside. I didn't even realize it was a realm. I just thought it was a very nice dream. And I thought when I was having, I thought I'm getting a, um, like a word of knowledge about where I need to call my secretary and be like, you know, go in the mail slots and get the stuff out. But it was real. It was real. And in a moment, God allowed my spirit to go from California up to Canada, grab some stuff in the spirit, and I don't understand fully how this works, but I got it in the spirit, and when I grabbed hold of it, I brought it back in the spirit to where my physical body was, and I physically got the manifestation of what had been missing. God knows every place where your missing stuff has gone. God knows every 
place where the stuff you've lost can be found. Listen to me this morning. I'm prophesying over you right now because there's some stuff that's coming back to you. There's some stuff that's coming back to you. There's some stuff that's coming back to you. Coming to you. Coming to you. Jeff and Suzanne, I heard the Lord say that inheritance is coming to you. Inheritance is coming to you. Inheritance is coming to you. Now, when God releases miracles in our lives and when the lost stuff starts coming back, we got to remember to steward what God has brought into our lives with integrity and hold these things that God brings to us as precious. We should never look at the things that God brings to our life and consider them to be just commonplace. But we got to hold them softly. Hold them, knowing that these are the precious things of heaven. And as quickly as he gives them to us, we need to be willing, when he speaks, to give them away. Amen? Okay. A few months later, I was preaching for my friend, Patricia King. She had invited me to a conference that she was going to be hosting in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And, you know... We love Phoenix. Phoenix is a great place. But I'm telling you, the glory of that conference, I mean, it was hot. It was hot in the spirit. It was hot. One morning I was worshiping the Lord and supernatural oil began flowing from the palms of my hands. Supernatural oil began flowing from my feet as I was worshiping the Lord. And this was the early days of Patricia beginning to do some television ministry at that time. And when they saw that the oil was, it was Patricia's husband that saw that the oil was flowing, he went and he grabbed the, the camera teams, the media crew, and they all rushed around me to film what was happening. And I don't think that we should make what God does to be a spectacle. But I do have to say I'm thankful that they had the insight to record and document because there's some people when I'm telling them these things, they say that could, that could never, no, that could never be. That can't be the truth. I've heard the dumbest things. Oh, he must have tubes all the way down. Can I tell you something? I'm not smart enough to figure out a tube system to go in the jacket around with bottles of oil pumping up out of my arms, into my... Not only that, but why would you want to match, manufacture something when you can have the real thing and all you got to do is lift up your hands to heaven and worship Him? It was in worship that the miracles began to flow. They were recording it, the miracle, the oil flowing out of my hands. There was so much oil came out of my hands that it filled about a quarter of a, a glass, a cup that they had brought to me and my hands were running, the oil was running into the cup. Then they had a, a cloth that they put under my feet. I took my shoes off because the oil was running inside of my shoes. So I took my shoes off and I stood on the cloth. And the oil was pouring into the cloth. And then I began to walk around on the cloth and that oil drenched the cloth. At the end of the meeting, some people took the cloth, they cut it all up into little squares. And we used it just like Acts 19, 11 and 12, where the handkerchiefs, the aprons were taken from the Apostle Paul's body where there was an anointing, a resident glory. And many miracles began to have extraordinary miracles. Healings, deliverance. People be, be, got in a line at the end of that meeting for me to lay hands on them. My, my hands were running with oil. And I was laying hands on every single person, maybe five, seven hundred people in that room. 
And I laid hands on every single person. The oil continued to flow every single person. There was a man that came that had cancer in his body. Stage four, the doctors had given up on him. I laid my hands on him and it really wasn't about me, but it was about the power of God that was flowing in that moment. He came into agreement with it, connected. He received his total and complete miracle. He got totally delivered from that cancer spirit that was trying to take him out. Every trace of cancer in his body vanished and he was made 100% whole. There was another woman in those meetings that had been told by the doctor over and over she could not have ch children and the reason why was because of the, uh, the way that things were not working inside of her body. It was impossible for her to have children. When my hands got laid upon her, I'm telling you, your hands are portals. And when God gives you the opportunity to lay your hands on the sick, you do it. Because God is behind you ready to back it up and confirm it. I laid my hands on that woman. She wrote about a little over a year later, the whole testimony. But what the doctors have said, what God did in that conference, and the fact that she got pregnant and she uh, birthed her child within that whole time frame. I mean, God works miracles. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil shows up and tells you you can't. Well, he's the father of lies. So if the devil shows up, tells you you can't, you know that you can. Hallelujah. <laughs> we had wonderful miracles. There was lots of miracles. I could tell you angels showing up, throwing orbs into the... The atmosphere, getting covered in glory dust. Up in the, the snack, there was a man that had come with another, there was a, believer, a new believer that had come. He was involved in the music entertainment industry. He had just, very, very famous. He had just given his heart to the Lord. He came to the conference and he brought his unsaved manager along with him. And the manager saw things that were happening in the room, but because they were so far back and they could only see parts and be, he's wondering if it, it was all a hoax, if it was fake, if, you know, this wasn't real, we were just trying to trick people. And so he came up to the green room afterwards and we were sitting there with Patricia and me and quite a few of the other ministers and this man that uh, had just recently gotten saved and his manager was sitting there just kind of looking at everybody, just, you know, skeptic, with skeptical eyes. And uh, he was sitting there, and the next thing you know, that same angel that showed up in the meeting showed up in the green room as we were eating chips and dip. And that angel pulled an orb out of heaven and threw that glory dust on that manager, on us. I mean, the whole room got covered. Guess what happened to that manager? He ended up on his knees with tears running down his face saying, Jesus, save me, Jesus, save me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it was a tremendous conference. It was an amazing time in the glory. And still, we, Janet and I still get testimonies coming in from that weekend that took place like, that was spring of 2007. So that was, how long is that? I'm not very good with math. How long is that? 13 or 14, okay, we're getting 13, 14, kind of that general vicinity of numbers. We're all working on math. Uh, so 13, 14 years ago, the testimonies are still coming in. How many testimonies are we going to be hearing in 13, 14, 15, 20 years from now? Because the impartation we received from God this weekend. And the amazing thing is when we continue moving in this, growing in the spirit, how much more is God going to do through our lives? Because he is faithful. He's faithful. So the next morning, it, the conference ended on Sunday night. The next morning, Monday morning, I was going to be driving to my friend Steve Swanson's recording studio down in Casa Grande, Arizona. And Steve's a tremendous worship leader. If you never heard his stuff, you need to download his stuff because it's amazing. I was going to be driving down there and I was going to be recording a CD that I ended up calling Spirit Spa, which is just piano instrumental, okay? So I went straight out of that miracle anointing into the studio 
to record this instrumental. Well, we were supposed to start in the studio at 8 a.m. Steve's a morning person. He would much, and it's very different for musicians because normally musicians are night owls. But Steve's a morning person, so he'd much rather work early in the morning till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then he's done, and then we rest, and then we start again early in the morning. Well, we were supposed to start at 8 a.m. My alarm never goes off. I never receive a phone call from the front desk, even though I called and asked them to give me a wake-up call. They never call. I wake up on my own, and I think it's 8.30 in the morning. I was supposed to be in the studio at 8 o'clock, and the studio is an hour drive from where I was staying. On top of that, Miss Janet was not with me at that conference, and so my room looked like a bachelor's pad. And I had stuff thrown all, I mean, we were just in conference mode, you know? And I'm a clean person. I like things neat and tidy. But we were in conference mode. I was just kind of whipping things around. All Anyway, I got up in a frenzy, and I had to clean. And I'm about to release, uh, work on this peaceful, instrumental, soaking album. And I'm running around my room like the Tasmanian devil, trying to pack everything up, get it in the, anyway, I do what I need to do. I put it in the car. I drive down to Steve's place. I'm in the spirit. We record the Spirit Spa CD. It was wonderful. And that CD has gone on to become my best-selling CD still to date. And that was 13, 14 years ago. So that's amazing. People use all, doctors, dentists. I was in Australia getting a massage. The, the pastors there had sent me to a spa. I was getting a massage, and I thought, this sounds familiar. <laughs> this is at the hotel on the Gold Coast of Australia. And uh, I said, what is that that you're playing? She said, oh, it's called Spirit Spa by Joshua Mills. <laughs> I said, that's me. That's my music. <laughs> she said, I love it. I use it all the time. <laughs> And she wasn't even connected. It's amazing. She wasn't even connected to the church, didn't know anything that was going on. So, of course, we invited her over to the meetings. And anyway, all that. It's so funny. So I recorded the Spirit Spa CD, drove from Casa Grande back to Palm Springs, California that night, arrived probably around midnight, maybe a little bit after midnight. In the morning, I was supposed to be catching a flight from Palm Springs to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And uh, so in the morning when I got up, I didn't have very much sleep that night, but just enough to get rested, get up, pack my bags, went to pack everything, went to put on my rings for travel because I was going to be out, I was going to be seen. So I, I, I went to put on uh, my, my wedding band, went to put on my watch, then I went to put on my pinky ring, and the pinky ring was gone. And if I put, if I pack my pinky ring, it's always in, the toiletry bag. I mean, that's one place that I packed. And as soon as I went to get it and it wasn't there, instantly I remembered where I put it. The night before, when I was at the hotel, I had put it on the bedside stand, and it is a very, very nice ring. And in all that commotion running around in the morning, I forgot the ring at the hotel. So I had to go to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I asked Janet, I said, would you call the hotel in Arizona and ask them about that ring and just get it back, get them to send it to us. And I went on to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Well, I, I was going to be ministering there. As soon as I landed, I called Janet because I was concerned about the ring. She said, I called the hotel. Nobody's seen the ring. I said, there is no way. I remember exactly where I put it. It was right on the bed stand beside the lamp. You need to call them back and get them to talk to all of their staff. So she did. She called them back, got them to talk to all the staff. Of course, the staff said that they had not seen the ring at all. So I was bothered by this because I knew exactly where the ring was. And uh, I had to minister that whole weekend in Cedar Rapids. Again, wonderful miracles. It was great. I was flying from Cedar Rapids back to Los Angeles this time to pick up Janet. Janet was going to meet me. We were going to fly together over to Fiji. We are going to be in Fiji for two days. And then we were flying over to New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, where we were going to be ministering for, I believe, three or four days. It was a short weekend conference that we were going to be at. Anyway, God did wonderful things at that conference in Auckland, but the whole time I'm thinking about the lost ring. And the reason why it bothered me so much about the pinky ring is because it was an inheritance ring. It wasn't just my ring that I lost, but I lost the inheritance that belonged to my son, belonged to my grandchild, belonged to generations. Some say generations. 
Do you realize that God cares about generations? And God wants you to step into a general, generational blessing today so that it can flow from your life to the lives of those that follow you. It doesn't matter what has happened up to this point. You might even look at in the natural and say, there's generational curses in my family. You can just break that by coming out of agreement with every single one of them. And instead say, I'm connecting with the generational blessing. From my life onward, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, they will be blessed. There is generational blessing for them. So the one night I'm ministering in Auckland, New Zealand, and the Lord puts it on my heart to share the testimony of the rings that I just shared with you that had happened in California when I lost the rings in Canada, and then I found them in uh, California by going into the Spirit and taking them. So the Lord told me to share that message. Well, the thing is this. I thought, I can't share that message because I've got my wedding band, I've got my wristwatch, but I don't have, I've been a terrible steward of this miracle. And I actually felt very guilty and shameful about it. And I said, I can't share it. And this is going on in my head. I mean, it's not a physical conversation. I'm ministering in this conversation. You don't understand the, the conversations that go on in preachers' heads. I mean, when we're in the pulpit, this is a place of spiritual authority. You shouldn't just say anything. Come on. We're responsible for every word that's spoken. So I'm having this conversation going back and forth thinking, God, I can't share that because what if they ask to see the ring and I don't have, and then I'm going to tell them like I just lost it. It's the most amazing miracle and I just was totally careless with it. How many of the devil always tries to get you to feel shame and guilt? The devil tries to steal your testimony. Come on. And of course, because the Lord was speaking, I said, okay, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to share it. So I shared the testimony that night after the meeting was done. And great miracles happened. But after the meeting was done, I excused myself from the meeting. And I was just trying to walk out, just kind of hiding and walking out. And as I was, there was a lady named Jane Neek. She's now in, with the Lord in, in glory. But she was a very unique and wonderful lady. But Jane stopped me and she said, Joshua, can I see that pinky ring? The one with the 47 diamonds. I said, oh, Jane, I don't have it with me right now. And I excused myself and I walked out. And I could not stop thinking about what Jane had said to me all night long. I thought, I cannot believe that I have lost that ring. I have lost the inheritance. And then my, my, my self-talk started to get into like really weird places like, well, how much would it be to try to go to a jeweler and ask them to try to recreate the same ring, but there's 47 diamonds, and I'm not sure I have enough money to replace all of them, but then I could maybe get cheaper diamonds, and how much are cheaper diamonds, and how much does it even cost for someone to do a, a custom ring, and then how would I tell them exactly what the ring looked like, because I'm not sure I remember all the... I mean, you can really get into weird places when you start to go down this deep, dark tunnel of I got to go back and my history and my family history and we did this and we did that and we lost this and we lost that and then all of a sudden it becomes all about you. Come on. I was in this place. Listen, I love God and I believe I have faith. I mean, people would say, oh yeah, Joshua, Miller, he's that glory guy. I love the glory. I believe in the, the miraculous. I believe that God does these things. But when I needed a miracle, I started to doubt all the ability of God and try to put more trust in what I could do for myself. Janet came to bed. I was still thinking about it. And I couldn't even sleep good. I was tossing and turning, thinking about this pinky ring that I lost. Then in the morning, I'm up first because I'm thinking about the pinky ring. And I'm sitting in bed. I mean, I said I'm up. I mean, like my body was like L-shaped in the bed. And uh, I still had my pajama head and my pajamas, my bed head and my bad breath. But I was sitting in the bed. And Janet was going to be ministering that morning. She looked at me. She said, um, why are you up? What? What's bothering you? Because she could tell I was bothered. I said, Janet, 
I said, I cannot stop thinking about that pinky ring. I can't believe I lost it. Not only belonged to me, it belonged to Lincoln. And Janet said, oh, come on, Joshua, just get up, get in the shower, and, you know, let's go down to the meeting. I said, I don't think I'm going to the meeting this morning. I, I just can't stop thinking about this ring. <laughs> Janet got up, she got dressed, got shower, I mean, showered, dressed, ready, went down to the meeting to minister, and here I am with bed head and a bad attitude. And I'm a minister. And I'm sitting in the bed and I'm thinking about the disappointment of losing this ring. Now, this is what's so amazing. In the middle of you thinking about all the stuff you can't, that's the place where God loves to break in and remind you that he can. With God, with God, all things are possible. With God. That word with means there's cooperation. That word with means there's a partnership. That word with God means that God wants to come to you and work with you to bring forth a miracle in your life. But you're going to have to learn how to submit to his spirit. I'm sitting in bed. Janet had opened up the window. I could hear the birds outside chirping. I could hear it. We were in a hotel that was kind of along the street, and you could hear the cars running along the street. I was still sitting in bed. The power of God, the glory began to surround me. I closed my eyes. When I closed my eyes, I could see a picture in my mind. This is a picture. I, I hadn't seen this picture anywhere else. It's not something I was just remembering. It was like I had a new vision being given to me in that moment. And in this picture, I saw this house. It was a stucco house, like the kind that you see in Arizona, you see in Phoenix. And I saw this house, and I had this desire to walk towards it and walk right in. Now, I wasn't caught up in a vision somewhere I was fully aware of being in Auckland, New Zealand, sitting in the hotel room in the bed. I could hear the birds. I could hear the traffic. But I could also see this picture that was being painted inside my mind. I walked towards the house. I let myself right in the front door. I could see the hallway. I could see the living room. I walked straight down the hallway, and I turned right. And when I turned right, there was series of other doors that were down that hallway. I walked down and I looked in the door and I looked over here to the left. And when I looked down inside this door, the door was open. There was a shelf that was about this high here. And I saw my pinky ring placed right on top of that shelf. This is in my mind. I saw it. When I saw it, my instinct in the natural Something Mama Billy, and I told you about Mama Billy a few days ago. Something Mama Billy told us is when you see stuff in the spirit, you reach out and you take it. And so I saw the pinky ring on that dresser. And I reached out and I grabbed hold of it on the dresser. I'm talking about with my eyes closed, fully aware that I was in bed, listening to the sounds of New Zealand. You know, the birds and the traffic. I reached out. I grabbed hold of that thing that I saw in the spirit and all of a sudden, when I reached out and I grabbed it, I physically felt it in my hand. In my hand. I opened up my eyes, I opened up my hand, and my pinky ring was inside my hand. Now, the Bible says, when the thief is found, when the thief is caught, not only do you get what was lost, but he has to repay with interest. Hallelujah. So I shut my eyes again and to see what else I could grab. And when I shut my eyes, I did not see a thing. There was no more house. There was no more room. There was nothing. I sat in that bed shaking under the power of God. Shaking under the power of God. I was in New Zealand. 
but in the spirit, I reach my hand into Arizona. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. I've thought about this many, many times since that happened. And there's other testimonies I could tell you about things that God has done and the way that God has used this testimony to unlock some realms for other people. That woman, Jane Neek, I told you about, she asked about the ring. I shared this testimony later that day in the conference about what God literally just did that morning. Jane was sitting there and she thought to herself, wow. Ten years prior, when she moved from England to New Zealand, she had lost a family heirloom that she had long given up that it was just gone. It was just gone. I mean, 10 years, it was gone. It got lost in the, in the move. And she, she said, when you were sharing, she said, I began to put my faith that God to, could reconnect me with every blessing that has gone missing in my life. The very next morning, she was sitting in a chair and at a little, uh, what do you call that, the vanity? set where she does her makeup and, and gets all done up every single morning she uses that set every single morning she said when she opened up the drawer that she opens every single morning that family brooch which was worth tens of thousands of pounds it was so old and so i mean it was an inheritance it was sitting in the drawer and all she had to do was reach out and grab it. And she looked at that thing like, can this really be? God did it. God did it. There's so many testimonies. I could tell you so many testimonies about this. But in thinking about this, I believe that the biggest thing that God is speaking, I believe it's a prophetic picture of what Colossians 1 verse 13 says, where it says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Do you realize what matters most to God? Do you know what really, really matters to God? Do you know what his heart is most after? It's not after material things. It's not after natural satisfaction. It's, it's, he's not just looking for a, a bigger church and a bigger building and a, a bigger this and a better that. He's looking for your soul. He's looking for those that are lost, those that are stuck in darkness. And he is reaching his hand into the midst of darkness. He's reaching out saying, I love you. I care for you. I died for you. I've given my life for you. And when he's stretching out his hand, we can see by the scars on his hand, the sign in his hand, the marks in his hand that he died and he rose again to give us new life, eternal salvation. And for anybody that's ready to let go of the darkness, to let go of the pain of the past, to let go of the sinful lifestyle, to let go of your shame and your guilt. He's reaching out his nail scarred hand to receive you as his own. And in an instant, he'll translate you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light. Today, if you're in this place and you say, I've never received Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to make the greatest decision you could ever make by saying, yes, Jesus, I need you. Yes, Jesus, I want you. His hand is reaching out for you. Will you respond to him and say, God, do your work in me? You don't have to carry around the baggage, the weight of sin any longer. You don't have to carry away around the shame and the guilt that you've carried. But in an instant, you can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness 
and be brought into the kingdom of his glorious light. If that's you this morning, I want you just to lift up your hand. Just tell me, Brother Joshua, I need you to pray for me this morning. I need you to pray for me. Some of you may be here and you say, I love God. And I've given my heart to Jesus. But somehow, through time, circumstance, I feel like my love for the Lord has grown dim. I don't have the fire, the passion that I used to have. I don't have the same zeal that I used to have. But I want the hand of God to touch me today and bring me into a place of his glorious life. I want to live in the glory. I want to live for his glory. If that's you this morning. I want you just to lift up your hands and say, Brother Joshua, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me. I want to be a thank you. I want to be on fire. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I want to receive a fresh passion, a new zeal for the things of God. I don't want to live my life the way I've been living it. I don't want to keep on going just through the motions. But God, I want to give myself to you completely. That your hand would come upon me and translate me from the place I've been into the place that you've promised. If you lifted your hand, I just want you to stand where you're at. Just stand up right now. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Just stand up right now. God is doing a deep work this morning. God's doing a miraculous work this morning. God is changing things, moving things, shifting things this morning. And I want everybody in this place just to lift up your hands to heaven. And together, let's pray this. And I want you to pray it with your mouth. I want you to make a sound as you pray this. Say, Father... In the name of Jesus, I give myself to you all over again. God, I thank you that you are faithful even when we are unfaithful. I receive your forgiveness today for every place where I feel like I'm a disappointment. God, I thank you that you remind me today that I am qualified because of the blood of Jesus. I give you my shame. I give you my sin. I give you my guilt. I give you my pain. And I know right now that you remove them from my life. Lord, I can feel your hand coming upon me. Your hand of favor. Your hand of forgiveness your hand of blessing, your hand of anointing. Lord, I am yours. I am yours. I belong to you. I belong to your kingdom. And Lord, right now, I thank you that you're translating me in the spirit from where I've been spiritually into the place that you have promised for me. Peace. Peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. The peace of God just floods this place. The peace of God just floods this place. The peace of God just floods this place right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. I want to ask the worship team just to come up here, the whole worship team, if you're able to. And I want everybody in this place just to stand up, lift up your hands into the glory. The glory's here. The glory's here. Just lift up your hands into glory right now. The peace of God is here. The peace of God. The peace of God. There's a new realm. 
There's a new place. There's a glorious place, a miraculous place, a heavenly place, a peaceful place that he has prepared for you. Lord, I thank you for it right now. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for it. I want you to sing this, say, peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. With wondrous billows of love. Come on, lift your hands and say, It's peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over. Over my spirit forever I pray with wondrous billows of love I want you to feel the love of God for you right now I want you to feel the peace of God surrounding you filling you his glory upon you within you it's a new realm it's a promised realm it's a realm where the promises of God come to pass it's not about struggle or striving or works it's not about what you can do it's about all that he has done in the glory we find rest for our souls so right now just lift up your hands and just receive it say Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. <laughs> there it is. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. With wondrous billows of love. When you're in the ease of the glory, when you're in the ease of the Spirit, you can go places that you've never been before. And you can do something that you've never done before. There's new faith that's coming to you right now to reach out and to receive all that God has said you could have. There's been things in your life, word curses that have been spoken against you said you could never have it, you could never do it, you could never be it. But I'm telling you, everything that the enemy has tried to steal, everything that the enemy has tried to take, everything that the enemy has tried to come in and make a mess in your life, God says, I'm giving you the right as a child of God. I'm giving you the authority as a son, as a daughter of God. I am giving you boldness in the spirit right now to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. Anybody ready to take some stuff back? Because there's some stuff that's coming back to you. I'm telling you this morning, there is stuff that's coming back to you. Oh, yes. God cares about your spirit, your soul as a priority. But the Bible says this, that when we come to God, we must believe that he exists, that he is. But that he's also a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So this morning, I want you to reach up into heaven. I want you to reach out in the spirit realm and I want you to get ready. Uh, ha. Hey, whoa, we're going in, we're going in, we're going in. 
and we don't have a bad mood going in. We're not disappointed going in, but our heart's in the right place. And God's given us the right, the authority to go in and take back everything that the enemy has tried to steal. Come on, let's do it. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. 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 The Satan is under my feet. Just if you could just give me 30 seconds, just sit down for one minute. I know I said, said give me 30 seconds in one minute, but I'm a, I'm a multiplication guy. Hallelujah. I believe in a double portion. <laughs> Ask for 30 seconds and said, give me a minute. Hallelujah. That's preacher talk for I lied. Listen, how many of you believe we've, we listen, we've, we've gone some places in the spirit. We've listen, we've we, we, we've moved some things in the spirit. And it's not about moving in terms of putting your shoulder against it and making it happen. It's about stepping into the move of God that we prophesied earlier that this is a move. God is always moving. His winds are always blowing. He's just simply looking for a people who would allow their hearts to become his sail. And there was something that Janet said earlier when we began to transition. And it was what she said to Joshua last night when they were leaving, saying, I believe that we're coming and we are reaping our harvest. I want you to say that. Say, I'm reaping my harvest. I'm reaping my harvest. I am reaping my harvest. And see, the attack against your heart has been an attack against your harvest. 
Joshua shared how he had an opportunity to get discouraged, even to feel shame. And it would have kept him from seeing what God desired to show. And I thank God this is a shame-free zone. Come on. But I want to tell you, listen, this isn't the only place God does miracles because he wants to do some miracles in your home. And I believe the new mind skins that have been formed even in this week and this weekend are allowing us to not only give the Lord a place in our heart, but also a place in our mind. Amen? That we would be glorified with Christ, not just in theory, but in how we think and how we speak. And when Janet said that, I was reminded of a verse in Galatians chapter 6, and I want to read to you verse 9 from the Passion Translation. Again, most of us are familiar. It says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap. Amen? Any ladies know what it means to be due? You see, you can want something to come out of season, but it isn't going to come until it's... And I'm here to tell you that Isaiah 60 verse 22 says, I will hasten all of this in its time. And so now is the time of God and it is your due season. Yes, it is. You see, Isaiah says to arise and shine in the midst of deep darkness when confusion is on the people, that's when you're gonna shine the brightest. Okay. And it gives all of these promises about your sons and your daughters coming from afar, kings coming to your council, camels coming with plenty. How did, God bless the camels. I hope there's some two humpers, amen? He gives all of these promises. He says, I will hasten it in its time. And we're in a season right now where I believe that time, season, the waiting is over and we are now due to give birth of what God has placed in us and desires to do for us. How many of you believe that? But in the Passion Translation, it says, don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds for the season of reaping the wonderful harvest, like Janet spoke about earlier, you've planted is coming. I'm not here to change a jot or touch a tittle, hallelujah, but I am here to give you a present application of this word. Your season of reaping is not coming. Your season of reaping begins today in Jesus' name. And in a season of reaping, you can't wait because if you leave it on the vine, it can grow bad. And I believe that we're in a time now we can begin to reach out and begin to lay hold, begin to pluck those promises right off of the vine. It encourages us and says, take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to others, especially to our brothers and sisters in the family of faith. It's one of the last things that we want to do today is to give you an opportunity to take advantage, to be a blessing to our brother, our sister, our family of faith. You see, when Paul was speaking this in Galatians chapter six, he said, those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. A sharing of wealth takes place between them. And there's been such a beautiful exchange already. But he says, make no mistake about it, God will not be mocked for whatever you plant It'll be the very thing, it'll always be the very thing you harvest. The harvest you reap reveals the seed that was planted. And I think for some of us, we have had a past harvest connected to a past seed that we don't want to reap in a coming season. Amen? I don't know about you, but there's been some things that I've planted by thoughts I had, words maybe I spoke, actions I took, and I want to see crop failure come by grace. I wanna see the blood of Jesus come across those fields to redeem those fields, to restore those fields, that I could plant new fields by faith. How many of you are with me? And so I wanna tell you, today is a day of reaping, but I also believe it's a day of new plantings. I believe that there's a season where favor is no longer forgotten and the fields are no longer forsaken, but we would recognize that God has given something to us that we've been blessed to give away. Amen? And so I wanna give you an opportunity to simply sow into this ministry and to respond. Just to simply give back out of what we've already received. How many of you would love an opportunity to sow into this family? Come on, hallelujah. Yes. They are coming into a brand new season. I believe it's a new and never before seen just like us. I believe this weekend is part of a first fruit. These are the, this is the first time that they've been able to minister live since October. 
Isn't that awesome? And I want to tell you, I do believe this is a season where not only is God going to do more with less of you having to leave, I believe this is a season where much of what you're called to will come to you. And this is a season of proper positioning and a posture that would not only allow you to prosper, but also would cause others to prosper as well. In fact, I even see like a school of prosperity. Like when schools are glory, you see, honestly, the church gets weird about that stuff. But Psalm 35, 27 says he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And God, listen, how many of you want to bring pleasure to God? Part of how we bring pleasure to him is by prospering. The way that we prosper is by taking heed according to every word that is spoken in this book and not letting this word depart from our eyes or depart from our mouth. And so I believe there's a school of the word and even a school of prosperity that's something about coming back to biblical principles that would release multiplication, not just in business and in ministry, but I believe in families, I believe in marriages. And I, and I believe that some of even what we tasted this weekend is a first fruit of what God is wanting to do down the road. I also recognize that there's probably, there may be places you're called to go or media you're called to create that either they don't have the resources to bring you in or you may not have the resource to get it out. But I believe that we have a privilege to help. Instead of pay it forward, sow it forward. Isn't that awesome? And not just for here and now, but we could do something that would benefit generations to come. Yes. How many of you would like to be a part of that? Yeah, so just stand to your feet. I just saw the clock and I'm like, man, time flew. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you enjoyed today? Come on. God is amazing. I encourage you go back and, and watch today's service over again. Go back and watch all of the services over again. But there is, there is, there's an impartation. Listen, I, I could care less oftentimes about information. I want impartation. Amen. And there is an impartation of the Lord that has been on each and every moment that was released today from the worship to the transition to the connect group leaders sharing their heart for community, you know, to every, everything that, that, was, that came out of this house today, whether it was from the, the stage or if it was spoken in the, to, by, to, by someone else to you in the restroom or the cafe, I wanna tell you, today has been a God day. It's been a day of divine appointment and new anointings. And so I wanna pray for you as we release you not to go back to life as usual. I don't believe in life as usual because you're unusual. Paul, you know, you're a peculiar people. Amen? We're called to make a difference. And so as we leave from this place, I encourage you to take what God has filled you with, allow it to overflow, and look to give it away wherever you go. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Fact, Pastor Tina, would you come with me? I just feel like you've got a closing word for this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to this house. God, we thank you for sending Joshua and Janet. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've invested in their life for so many years. And Lord, we thank you that this week we got to sit at their table and to feast on your faithfulness. God, I thank you for the testimonies. Lord, we don't celebrate those from a distance, but we invite those words that prophesied into our life to now come to pass because we didn't come to just hear about it. We came to see it in his life and in their life so we could begin to speak it and see it in ours as well. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you that testimonies are not entertainment, but they are a bridge into the never before seen. And Lord, right now, Lord, we take a step of faith into that new place that has been paved through the power of testimony. Yes, Lord, and I just, I thank you, Lord, that you've been just speaking to so many of us to, the hopelessness was attached to faith. And this weekend, wow. our faith got filled up. I thank you, Lord, that you continue to just increase our faith. Holy Spirit, draw us back to the word. Yeah. Create that new hunger. I thank you for the portals that have been opened that wow. are never closed. Lord, I thank you that everything that has been done, deposited in the spirit, every word spoken back and forth to the restroom in between. Lord, I just pray you would seal it by your spirit. And I just pray a hedge of protection around it. Anything that the Lord gave, yeah. only us can give it away. 
The enemy has no right over it. And so, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that what we have, we are going to multiply quickly. And I just thank you for the angels that were released here. Lord, we saw them. We felt them. Those who did not see, I thank you that they will have eyes to see. Lord, and that they, these angels are with us, that they remain. And I just pray that you would continue to increase in every single life here, every family. And I just bless this beautiful family as they go forth. And I just pray there be a ripple effect that what we sow would be sowed into their own lives, not just financially. Lord, but every way they showed honor in this home that they would have in multiplication, every place they went, they would leave a deposit of honor, Lord, that it's just a beautiful gift that you gift wrapped it to us. So we're so thankful. And we just say that this will be a season for such a time as this. Heaven on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you give today, give with expectancy for what God is about to bring back into your life. Amen. We love you. We bless you. Have an incredible afternoon.